morning, everyone. This is Gerald McKeegan coming to you from the Chabot Space and Science Center. Uh, hang on just a second here, got a little technical problem. There we go. So we're up here at the Chabot Space and Science Center in the Oakland Hills. And uh, tonight we are going to do our uh, monthly program called The Sky This Month. Uh, and we've got a few other things uh, to talk about tonight. Uh, I've heard rumors that there is a comet out there, so we got to be sure to talk about that. If you look behind me, you see the planet Mars over here. We're in our Going the Distance exhibit, and uh, in this exhibit there is a Ma Mars uh, globe. Uh, it's about five feet in diameter, has a lot of details on it. Great thing to look at next time you're up at Chabot, which we understand it's going to be a while, but uh, we want to encourage you to keep thinking about that. We also want to encourage you to keep thinking about uh, making donations. So you may have noticed on the Facebook page, we now have a donation button. So uh, please, all the support you can give us, we really would appreciate. So uh, what I'd like to do here, if you'll bear with me just a second here, I'm going to change to a different uh, screen over here. and. What we'd like to do is start out by showing you a little video. Uh, this will be our um, program called The Sky Tonight, or rather The Sky This Month, and it's produced and narrated by Don Saito. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and start that video here. Uh, a couple of buttons I need to push here, including silencing myself. Hey there, everybody. Just because current conditions are such that we can't meet inside our amazing Zeiss Planetarium at the Chabot Space and Science Center, doesn't mean we can't go outside and look up at the real sky ourselves. This short presentation will help guide you to find several bright stars and constellations. For the month of July, from about 10.30 to 11 p.m., we are into the summer season of constellations, and it's these I'll be pointing out. Why the late hours, you might ask? It's because during the Northern Hemisphere's summer season, the days are longer and the nights are shorter. That, plus daylight savings time, means late starts for us night sky watchers. By the way, if you weren't already aware, yes, the constellations have seasons. For example, you'll never see Perseus the hero during the summer, and likewise you'll never see Hercules the strong man in the winter. We'll meet Hercules in just a bit. As you probably already know, the Earth has four seasons, spring, summer, fall, and winter. Well, the constellations also have seasons, having to do with the Earth's orbital path around the Sun. That and the fact that we can only see stars by looking away from the Sun at night, which changes our view of the stars throughout the year. Unfortunately, unless you're at a good dark sky site, most constellations will be somewhat hard to see fully, but most constellations have at least a few bright stars to help identify them, and the better your viewing location, the more you'll be able to see. A good first step to finding the constellations is done by knowing your compass directions. We can easily do this without a compass using a star grouping that almost everyone is familiar with, the Big Dipper. First, find the Dipper with its curving handle and bowl. The two stars at the end of the bowl are called the pointers, because if you take the distance between them and extend that distance out about five times, you'll come to a semi-bright star known as Polaris, and otherwise known as the North Star. It's the only star in the entire sky that stays pretty much right where it is, so no matter what time of the night it is, or even what month of the year it is, all you need to do is face it, and you'll always be facing due north with east directly to your right, west directly to your left, and south directly behind you. All the other stars wheel around this pivot point anti-clockwise, making them appear to rise in the east and set in the west. This is of course an illusion caused by the Earth's spin, which gives the appearance that the stars are moving, when in fact it is the Earth that's moving. If you think of the Earth as a spinning top, and you extend Earth's North Pole straight up into the sky, it points almost directly at Polaris. 
I should also point out that the Big Dipper is not a constellation. It's only part of the constellation Ursa Major, the Great Bear. He's a bit sideways at this time, but the end of the Big Dipper's handle is the tip of his nose, and the bowl is like a saddle on his back. The Big Dipper is what is called an asterism, which is defined as a familiar star grouping. Using Polaris, we found all the compass directions, but Polaris is also the end of the Little Dipper's handle, whose official name is Ursa Minor, the Little Bear, and our next constellation. It's a bit faint, but from Polaris, you might be able to trace its curving handle to its bowl. The two brighter stars at the end of its bowl are called the Guardians, because they seem to march around the North Star like protective sentries throughout the night. Over here, we have Draco the Dragon, with his squarish head, long neck, two short legs and feet, and long tail, which arcs gracefully over the Little Dipper. Rising in the northeast, we have a lesser-known pole-finding constellation, Cassiopeia, the Queen, also known as the Big W, made up of these five fairly bright stars here. We can use Cassiopeia to find the North Star by using a fainter sixth star off the tip of the more squashed end of the W. How nice! This is particularly useful because it is almost opposite the Big Dipper's pointer stars, which generally aren't visible for several months of the year depending on your latitude. So, when the dipper is down, Cassiopeia is up. Thus, we can find the North Star no matter what the season. Now, we use the pointers in the Big Dipper's bowl to find Polaris and the Little Dipper. Now, let's use the Big Dipper's curving handle to find our next constellation. Simply follow the arc of the dipper's handle in a continuing arcing line to find the bright star Arcturus, which is the lap of Bootes the herdsman. In other words, follow the arc to Arcturus. He's got a flat triangular cap, a large head, a triangular body that appears to be in a sitting position, his leg and foot, and he's smoking a pipe. A simple shepherd keeping watch over his flock. To find our next constellation, continue that arcing line from the Big Dipper's handle, go through Arcturus and Bootes, and speed on to the bright star Spica, which is the rump of Virgo the Virgin, located in the west-southwestern sky. In other words, follow the arc to Arcturus and speed on to Spica. Most of her stars are pretty fairly faint, and her overall shape is pretty rough as an approximation of a woman lying down, but she has a head, one arm pointing up, a body, two legs, and of course her shiny rump star Spica. Virgo is our first zodiacal constellation this Kated evening. The west, south, As you might know, sky. all the signs of the words, zodiac are constellations, the arc to which you may not realize, though, is that the zodiacal constellations appear to form a ring around our faint, planet and that, when viewed from the ground, appears to form a line in the sky line going down. roughly from but east to head, west. One arm pointing to illustrate this more body, easily, let's turn our view to the south, which will flip everything we've seen so far Topsy is our first zodiac. We call this line the ecliptic, the and it is only along this line the that the sun, the moon, and planets move. This is why the zodiacal constellations are so significant to astrologers. Not that astronomy scientists believe in the pseudoscience of astrology, most don't. But astrologers were some of history's first astronomers, and for their early work, we are in their debt. Since we found one zodiacal constellation, let us locate the others that are up around this time. To the left of Virgo, and just above the southern horizon, we find Libra, the scales. Unfortunately, Libra is very faint, so you probably won't see it unless you're at a good dark sky site on a moonless night. But, if you are, you can see its triangular top and its two balancing arms. For those of you too young to know about this ancient technology, scales were used to figure out how much things weighed by putting an item of unknown weight on one side of the scale and then adding known weights to the other side until the two sides became perfectly balanced. The known weights would then be added up to give the weight of the object. Nowadays, it's all done electronically with digital readouts. But anyways, back to our zodiacal constellations. To the left of Libra, we find the constellation of Scorpius, the Scorpion, or, as astrologers call him, Scorpio. He's got two arms and claws, 
his bright reddish heart is Antares, and a long body with Stinger. Because the scorpion is a sign of the zodiac, and because the planets only move along the ecliptic where the zodiacal constellations are found, sometimes the also reddish in color planet Mars passes near Antares. Mars represents the Greek god of war, Ares, so to avoid confusing the two reddish stars, one is called Ares and the other is called not Ares or Antares. Clever, eh what? To the left of Scorpius is the constellation Sagittarius the Archer, with his triangular head, body, feet, left hand holding out his bow while his right hand is held aloft as though he just loosed an arrow. Just to the left of Sagittarius are two bright quote-unquote stars, which aren't stars at all, but rather the planet Saturn on the left and Jupiter on the right. If you get a chance, take a look at them through as big a telescope as you can. They are both rather spectacular. Leaving the ecliptic with its zodiacal constellations, our next constellation is the small but pretty Corona Borealis, the northern crown. It can be found just behind the head of Bootes, the herdsman. The semi-bright star in its center is appropriately called Gemma. The open end of the northern crown points towards the squarish head of our next constellation, Hercules, the strong man. That square is the asterism called the keystone, and from there you might be able to make out the rest of him. A man running along whilst brandishing a large club. An activity typical of strong men back in the day, apparently. Found just behind Hercules is Lyra, the lyre, a small Greek harp marked with the sixth brightest star out of the entire sky, Vega. Next up, we see Cygnus the swan with his bright star Deneb, wings, feet, long neck, and nose. Just below Cygnus, we have the constellation Aquila the eagle. He's a bit faint, but has a head with a beak and its bright eye Altair, two swept forward wings, a body and tail. The three bright stars, Vega, Altair, and Deneb, make up the asterism we call the Summer Triangle. We'll be seeing the Summer Triangle through summer and well into the fall. This month, we've got a rather spectacular surprise in the form of the first naked eye comet we've seen in years, NEOWISE C-2020 F3, which will become visible within an hour after sunset from around July 14th through the 23rd, and perhaps beyond. You won't want to miss it. Use binoculars for best views. And that's it. There are other smaller or fainter constellations out there, which I encourage you to look for using a good book and maybe a pair of binoculars, too. Speaking of good books, I cannot more highly recommend the book The Stars, A New Way to See Them by the author H. A. Ray, who you may know as the same author who wrote the Curious George books. Ray was a scientist who wasn't satisfied with the way modern star charts were drawn. The astro scientists were not interested in the characters, objects, or stories behind the constellations, so for convenience, they just connected the brighter stars into weird geometric shapes, slapped on their Greek names, many of which would mean nothing to the common person, and left it at that. That's all fine and well for them, but for us regular folk, we're more interested in the fun stuff. If you really want to learn the constellations, get Ray's book which we usually sell here at Chabot's Starry Night gift shop or from Amazon.com for about $17. I'd also recommend getting a pair of binoculars before getting a telescope. Binoculars are cheaper and easier to use, and there are many wonderful deep sky objects that can actually be best seen with just a pair of binoculars that are noted in Ray's book. If you do want to get a telescope, ask us or research on the web how to make an informed purchase. Be warned. There are a lot of bad telescopes out there with cheap components and shaky, muddy, fuzzy views that will disappoint you every time. A good scope will inspire you and your children to a lifetime of deep space exploration and an appreciation of science and nature in general. If you're interested in getting into the hobby of astronomy, joining a local astronomy club can be most helpful. Chabot is partnered with the EAS, the East Bay Astronomical Society, 
which has many activities and resources you'll find essential to helping get started in this amazing and beautiful study of our natural universe. Thanks for watching this video. If you like this content, be sure to click the thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel, and hit the bell notification icon to find out when new content has been uploaded. This will really help our channel to grow, which will make us very happy. And we'll see you in the future. was pretty interesting a uh, cute little girl that showed up in there um, so you got a chance to see uh, what all is up tonight uh, we'll talk about the comet in a few minutes here uh, one of the things that Don noted was the fact that uh, both uh, Jupiter and Saturn are up right now so if you go up uh, go out let's say around 10 o'clock tonight if you have clear skies um, and look to the southwest or the southeast rather uh, you'll see both Jupiter and Saturn. Jupiter will be the bright one on the right, and Saturn will be the dimmer one on the left. And if you've got a telescope, uh, check it out. You'll be able to see a lot of detail on both. You'll definitely be able to see the moons of Jupiter. Uh, you'll also be able to see the rings of Saturn very easily. Uh, in fact, the moons of Jupiter, sometimes a, a good pair of binoculars will actually show the moons of Jupiter. But, uh, um, you know, even a small telescope, you'll easily see the moons of Jupiter and the rings of Saturn. So that's something to check out. I know a lot of people in the Bay Area are fogged in right now. Uh, but if you get a chance to uh, go somewhere or if you happen to have clear skies, you want to check out uh, Jupiter and Saturn. Now, I mentioned that uh, Mars is behind me here, the Mars globe, and our uh, little Mars uh, rover yard. Uh, there is a Mars mission coming up, and uh, we've got uh, several events to commemorate that and to celebrate it. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of a rundown about what's coming up in the next few weeks. Uh, next Friday, we are going to have Mars Madness, and we're going to do lots of different activities associated with the upcoming launch of the Perseverance rover to Mars. Um, we'll be uh, doing some talks and some uh, fun events up here. We're going to bring the rover CJ, which is a quarter-scale rover that's identical to the Curiosity rover that's on Mars right now. And we'll show you some of uh, its um, capabilities. And uh, we'll just have a lot of fun that night. And then for those of you who don't mind getting up really early in the morning, on July the 30th, Thursday to July the 30th, uh, at 4 o'clock a.m., we are going to start our uh, Mars 2020 launch party. Uh, the Mars 2020 spacecraft is currently scheduled to launch at about 4.50 a.m. Pacific time on Thursday the 30th of July. So we are going to do a launch party here, and you'll be able to follow the launch from here at Chabot. We will have commentary from uh, a couple of... Uh, knowledgeable people can answer your questions and uh, also you know describe a little bit about what's going on as they prepare to launch and what will come up at once it does launch and on its way to Mars. Um, the next day, Friday the 31st, we are going to have a guest speaker. Uh, Dr. Lauren Abbott from Ames Research Center is going to do a presentation at 8 o'clock on Friday the 31st, and she will be talking about some of the materials that are used on the Mars rover and the Mars cruise stage and so forth, uh, some of the thermal control materials and some of the other things that uh, are used to protect the spacecraft and will be used not only on this Mars mission, but on future Mars missions as well. So that's uh, Friday the 31st at 8 o'clock. The following Friday, I'm going to be back again, and um, 
I'm going to attempt to teach you a little bit about uh, orbital mechanics. Uh, the program is going to be titled Getting to Mars, Orbital Mechanics for the Mathematically Challenged. Uh, so if some of you may be a little bit familiar with orbital mechanics, you know there's a lot of math involved in it. Uh, I'm going to try to present uh, some orbital mechanics about how we get from Earth to Mars, why it takes so long, and I want to do that without any math. So uh, I'll, I'll warn you right now that several astronomy friends of mine, uh, when I tell them I'm going to do orbital mechanics with no math, then they just laugh at me. So it'll be interesting to see how that works out. Okay, well, let's see. Let me uh, switch here for a second here. I've got some other things I want to show you. Um, you've maybe heard that there's a comet up there. So uh, what we want to do is maybe talk about that a little bit. The comet is called Neowise. And Neowise was discovered by the Neowise spacecraft. Uh, the NEOWISE spacecraft is a satellite that orbits around the Earth, and it's equipped with an infrared camera. Now, it was launched back in 2009, and at that time, its primary mission was to scan the skies, uh, looking at stars and clouds of gas and dust and so forth, uh, and looking at their infrared signatures. Infrared is light that we can't see with our naked eye. It's basically heat. Um, it's a longer wavelength form of light. And uh, it turns out that things can look very different when we're looking at them in infrared versus visible light. So the, the spacecraft, which was originally just called WISE, was launched in 2009. Uh, in order for that camera to work properly, it has to be cooled to a very cold temperature. So the spacecraft carried uh, a large volume of liquid hydrogen to keep the camera nice and cold. Well, eventually the liquid hydrogen ran out, and so they could no longer keep it as cold as they needed to do the, the original mission. However, the camera still worked, and it was still fairly cold. So it could still do some infrared detection. So in 2011, the WISE spacecraft was repurposed, not for looking at stars, but for searching for near-Earth objects, NEOs. And it, the mission name got changed from WISE to NEOWISE. And so that spacecraft has been uh, doing uh, near-Earth object searching um, ever since 2011. And in March of this year, late March, it spotted an object which turned out to be a comet that was approaching the sun. Uh, that, at that time, it was still pretty far out from the sun, but uh, it did recognize that this was a comet. Some, several other observatories spotted it uh, subsequently, and we were able to uh, get a really good uh, prediction of its orbit and we realized that it was going to go around the sun and it was also going to get fairly close to the earth so that we would be able to see it possibly without uh, a telescope or without binoculars to see it naked eye. So the comet was named Neowise after the, uh, the spacecraft that discovered it, which is the tradition. We normally name comets after the individual or the observatory that discovers it. Uh, that comet uh, went around the sun, uh, what we call perihelion, which is when it's closest to the sun. Uh, it reached perihelion on July 3rd, and it has now swung back around, and it's now on its outbound leg. The comet comes from the Oort cloud, and the Oort cloud is a huge swarm of icy bodies out at the very fringes of our solar system, more than a thousand times farther from the sun than the Earth. And uh, every once in a while, one of those icy bodies way out there uh, gets, breaks loose from its normal orbit, uh, either bumps into another object or it gets uh, gravitationally perturbed by a passing star, and then it starts its inbound journey towards the sun and it swings around the sun and then heads back out. In the case of Neowise, it has an orbit that will take it roughly 
7,000 years, maybe a little bit less, to make one orbit around the sun. And most of the, that orbit is so far out that we can't even see it even with telescopes. But for a brief period, it's in close enough to the sun where we can see it with our telescopes and with our binoculars, and even, for some people anyway, naked eye. And as it gets close to the sun, the ice on the comet begins to go through a process called sublimation. There's several different kinds of ice. There's water ice, carbon dioxide ice, carbon monoxide ice, uh, possibly ammonia ice, methane ice, and so forth. And because it originated far out in the solar system, it's very cold out there, so things that we normally think of as being gases out there, they freeze and become solid uh, ice. But as the comet gets close to the sun, that, that ice begins to warm up, and it converts from being solid ice to a gas. Now, unlike the ice from your refrigerator, uh, the ice on the comet does not go through a liquid stage. It goes directly from solid to gas, and we call that process sublimation. And during the sublimation process, that gas is released by the comet, and initially it forms a cloud around the nucleus of the comet. Uh, that cloud's called a coma, and then eventually the gas is blown away from the comet by the solar wind. Now, embedded in all that ice is a lot of rock. It's very small rocks, things that are the size of grains of sand, or pebbles, or maybe occasional fist-sized rock. Uh, but they're all embedded in the ice. And when that ice begins to sublimate, it releases that material, those particles that are embedded within the ice, and that becomes a tail also. And quite often what we see are two tails coming off of a comet. One is the particle tail, and the other is the gas tail. So up until recently, Comet Neowise was viewable in the early morning, pre-dawn hours. But after it went around the sun and after it got a little closer to the Earth, it is now viewable in the evening. So what I'd like to do is just show you a few photographs that have been taken by some of uh, Chabot's associates, some of our friends and uh, participants up here, and just give you an idea of what it looks like. So I'm going to start out here, if you'll bear with me. There we go. So this first image was taken by Bob Miner. Bob is a member of the East Bay Astronomical Society. Uh, and this image was taken during the, one of the early morning uh, hour uh, things about uh, a week and a half or two weeks ago. And you see the comet. You see that it has a nice long tail. The tail that you see is the particle tail. The particle tail tends to be white in color or yellowish in color. Um, the gas tail is not visible in this image. Uh, in fact, I think only one of the images that I have here will show the gas tail and then just barely. So anyway, this was Bob Miner. He was up at Tilden Park, uh, I believe at Inspiration Point in Tilden Park when he took this image here. Okay, next image. You know, maybe we'll get it. There we go. All right, this was taken by um, the wife of Gert uh, Gottschalk. Gert is another EAS member. He's on the board of directors of the EA East Bay Astronomical Society. Gert is German, and he spends half his time here and half his time in Germany. And his wife is in Germany right now, and she's in Berlin. And she was able to capture this image using her smartphone. Uh, some of you folks may have smartphones that have a nighttime mode on it. And even though you may not be able to see the comet uh, naked eye, if you use your smartphone, if it has nighttime mode, you can actually capture an image of the comet. And this is a good example. Now, you notice the tail is pointing almost straight up. That tells us that these are morning shots. Uh, because of the angle of the tail and the rotation of the Earth and so on, when we were viewing it in the morning, the tail was pointing almost straight up from the horizon. And you'll see a few more images to, sh to show that. 
Uh, now that it's an evening comet, you'll notice that the tail has more of an angle to it. And we'll see that here in a few minutes here. So the next image, uh, this is a really beautiful one. This was taken by Wesley Chang. He's another EAS member, also a board member. And I'm not sure what the body of water is here, but this, this was just a really great image that, that we saw. And again, you see the tail is pointing almost straight up, so that tells you this is an early morning image. Uh, next one here was taken, oh yeah, this is taken by Alan uh, Roche, an EAS member, also from Tilden Park, and he got really lucky. Um, he captured the International Space Station going by, so that, that street that you see underneath the comet, that's actually uh, the International Space Station in its orbit around the Earth. Uh, in order to take images like this with a digital SLR camera, uh, we have to use long exposures, exposure those that are five, six, seven seconds, something like that. And so the International Space Station, it's moving continuously, so it shows up as a streak rather than um, as a single point of light. It was interesting, Alan didn't realize he had captured this. He was up uh, at Tilden Park and he was just taking the images of, of the comet over and over again. And then somebody asked him later on, well, did you get the International Space Station when it went by? And he wasn't sure, so he went back and looked through his images and sure enough, there was one where he captured the International Space Station right underneath the comet. All right, so the next one, this one is taken by Dan van der Zanden. And again, this one nicely shows the, the, the horizon. You see that the comet's tail is pointing straight up, so it tells us once again that this was an early morning um, image. Uh, the other clue, you, you may not recognize it, but you, the, the constellation Ursa Major and the Big Dipper are in the image, and because of the angle that they're in, we know that it's rising rather than setting, so this tells us it's a morning image. All right, next image. Ah, David Shaw, another EAS member, uh, he has a, a second home up in the Sierras, up near Susanville, I believe it is, or Lake Almanor. And uh, they have very dark skies up there. And so he was able to capture a very nice evening shot. You notice that the tail is now uh, going off at an angle. Uh, so that tells us this is an evening shot and uh, just a really great view of the comet uh, from a very dark sky location. Uh, let's see, I got one more here. Uh, some guy named Gerald McKeegan. Oh, that's me. Uh, this was taken from very light polluted skies over the city of Walnut Creek. Uh, I did this a couple of nights ago. Uh, so it just gives you an idea of what's up there. Now, all of these pictures make it look like the comet is nice and bright. You ought to be able to just run outside, forget the camera, forget the telescope, forget the uh, binoculars, and just run outside and see it. Unfortunately, you won't be able to, to see it that way. Uh, if you're in a fairly dark location, naked eye, you might be able to see it as a very faint smudge in the sky, but you'd have to know right where to look, and you might find that rather than it being nice and distinct, it's something that sort of just seems to go in and out uh, depending on the atmospheric conditions. So the way to really see it is to use a pair of binoculars. Um, it, if you have a small telescope, even that will work. Uh, you'll, you'll have to figure out where to point the telescope or the, or the binoculars, and I'm gonna show you that here in a minute. And just look in the right direction and you know, wait till about 9.45 or 10 o'clock. You'll be looking in the northwest sky. In fact, why don't I show you the map here, there you go. Uh, looking in the northwest sky, it's below Ursa Major, below the Big Dipper. Uh, right now it's about 20 degrees or so above the horizon, but each night it gets a little bit higher. 
So if you look into the northwest sky, scan it with your binoculars, you ought to be able to find it if you have clear skies. Now the comet has already gone around the sun and it's on its way back out. So uh, it is moving away from the sun and as it does so, it will begin to fade a little bit. But it just so happens that the orbital path is such that even though it's moving away from the sun, it's actually moving closer to the Earth. So this comet is going to be fairly bright in the sky for several more days. In fact, it will get closest to the Earth on the night of July 22nd uh, at about uh, 5.37 uh, p.m. in the evening on the 22nd is when it will be closest to the Earth. After that, it will very slowly move away from the Earth. You'll still be able to see it for quite a while after that, but it will start to fade out, and eventually it'll get too far away from the sun, the tail will fade away, and uh, it'll just head on out there, and you'll have to wait 7,000 years before you get to see it again. So that's Comet Ison. Um, if you want to take pictures uh, uh, with a digital SLR camera, my recommendation is that you uh, get a camera with a little bit of a telephoto lens, like something like 70 millimeter lens or 100 millimeter lens. Um, and you want to set it for a fairly high ISO, like 1600 ISO, and plan to shoot uh, say five to ten second images. You don't want to go any longer than ten seconds because if you capture stars in the image you go more than ten seconds and they're going to start to trail because of the rotation of the earth. But uh, it's a lot of fun to get out there and try to take a picture so I really encourage you to, to try to do that. All right, so that's the comet Ison. Let me get back to live image here. Here we go. So I guess right now we're going to uh, take questions, and you're going to have to bear with us a little bit. We're having some technical problems viewing the, uh, the chats and comments. So uh, Jessica Williams is up here with me. She's at a nice safe distance over there. So what she's going to do is read the uh, comments that she sees uh, and then read them to me, and then I will respond to them. So why don't we go ahead, Jessica? What's our first comment? Okay, the location, I, I assume, since I've already told you where to find it in the sky, I assume you mean where's a good spot to go uh, to see it. Well, first thing you need to do is get out of the fog. So you need to go uh, a little bit to the east. Um, I, like I say, I was able to, to pick it up um, from a, an open field in Walnut Creek. So it's not too difficult to find. But if you could get somewhere a little bit farther away from city lights, uh, not too far though, you just you know find find a, a hilltop. Uh, several people uh, said they were able to see it nicely from uh, Inspiration Point in Tilden Park. Um, and again, if there's no fog, uh, but in, any place where you can get out of the fog and get away from the city lights a little bit. You don't have to get away a, a lot, but if you can get away from the lights a little bit and bring your binoculars and figure out which way is northwest and scan the sky and you should be able to see it. All right, next question. Which direction uh, does one need to look to see the ISS? Uh, well, okay, the ISS, uh, you, you don't see it every night. Uh, the ISS uh, orbits the Earth every 92 minutes, and its orbit shifts every orbit. So it shifts in, in relative to the ground. So uh, if you're familiar with uh, GPS coordinates and things, uh, it shifts 20, roughly 23 degrees of longitude on each orbit. So if it goes directly overhead tonight at, say, 10 o'clock, it will not go directly overhead an hour and a half later. It's going to be shifted uh, 23 degrees uh, in, in longitude. So what you need to do is figure out uh, how, when it will be overhead, when it will be visible, and there's a couple ways to do that. Uh, 
some of you may have uh, programs like uh, um, Sky Safari or something like that on your smartphones. That can tell you when to expect to see uh, the International Space Station. You can also look on the web. There are a couple of sites. One I use is called heavensabove.com. Uh, it's heavens-above.com. And you go to that website, you tell it where you're going to be located, and it will give you a 10-day forecast of when the uh, International Space Station will be overhead. It'll tell you in what direction to look when it first appears, how high it will get in the sky, and in what direction it will disappear. So uh, that's really the best way to do that. Uh, so off the top of my head, I can't tell you when because, like I say, it, it changes every night. All right, next question. How can we support the center while it's temporarily closed? Great question. How do you support the center while it's temporarily uh, operating in a reduced mode. We don't want to say it's closed because we're really not closed. We're just doing things a little bit differently. We're not open to the public, but we are doing a lot of programming, uh, and you're seeing a, a, an example of it tonight. But if you want to support Chabot, one way you can do that, if you look on the Facebook page right now, you'll see a donation button, and I see that it's been the, the donation amount has been going up very nicely during the program. Uh, that's one way. You can go to Chabot's website, uh, and up at the top of the page, you'll see a donation button there. Um, or if you want to, you can just put a check in the mail and mail it to Chabot. The, the address is Chabot Space and Science Center, 10,000 Skyline Boulevard. So it's 10,000. That's a one with four zeros after it. Uh, 10,000 Skyline Boulevard, Oakland, California, 94619. Um, so any way you can get the, uh, a check to us or a donation to us, we would just really appreciate it. We, uh, we are, because we are not open to the public, our revenue stream has gone down quite a bit. We still have a lot of things we need to do, a lot of programming we, that we need to do. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the things we're looking to here as the schools open in whatever format they end up opening here in the fall, they're going to need a lot of online programming, and Chabot was planning to produce some of that online programming to help teachers um, do their programs online. So please continue to donate, to uh, continue to support us. We really appreciate it. Okay, next question. You should be able to see it from the College of San Mateo uh, campus. Uh, in fact, almost anywhere in California, you should be able to see it if you're not in fog. Uh, again, you just look to the northwest. You know, this thing is way out in space. It's about 60 million miles away from the Earth. So just about anywhere where it's dark, uh, you should be able to see it. I was talking to my daughter earlier today, uh, or this evening, rather, she lives in uh, North Carolina uh, on a uh, place out in the middle of farm country, so they have really dark skies there, and she was able to see it. So, um, he, you know, just anywhere where you got dark skies uh, around 945 tonight, uh, look to the northwest and you should be able to see it. All right, next question. No questions. I've stumped to stars. <laughs> okay, well, we'll wait a couple of minutes here. Um, again, I want to encourage you to uh, stay with us here. We've got a number of events coming up, the, the Mars Madness next, uh, next Friday. Um, one of the, I guess, I, w I won't say highlights, but one of the interesting things that we'll do uh, next Friday is we'll show you a Mars rover uh, it's a quarter-scale Mars rover that is fully operational. It drives around. It has a tool arm that moves back and forth. Uh, has camera on board and so on. And it's a great demonstration tool. Uh, we have been using it to go around to schools and libraries uh, back before the pandemic started. Uh, so 
we're, we're going to just do a little bit of video so you can see that next next Friday. And then, of course, there's the the launch on the 30th. Um, the, that date is still firm. They've been holding that date now for over a week, so it looks like uh, they're going to make it. However, it's still possible that they may have to postpone the launch. Uh, they have until the middle of August to uh, launch and still be in the right configuration to get to Mars. So uh, I'm hoping they, they finally get it off the ground here on the 30th because as they get farther into August, it becomes a little bit more of a challenge. And that's one of the things we'll talk about when we, when we do our, our orbital mechanics program on August 7th. So any new, new comments? Will we try to look at the comet with our big telescope? We will try. Um, tomorrow night, uh, we have our virtual telescope program. It starts at 9.30. And if the weather cooperates, we will open the telescope and we will point it at the comet. And you will see a very much a close-up view of the comet uh, as it moves across the sky. Uh, so we're really hoping that the weather is going to cooperate with us. If it's foggy or if the humidity is too high, we won't be able to open it. But uh, the forecast I looked at earlier today says we've got a fairly good chance of having good weather tomorrow night. So keep your fingers crossed. Uh, if you see any fog forming, blow it away, and we'll try to look at it at the comet with the telescope. Do I have a favorite space event? Uh, geez, there's, there are a lot of them, but one that comes to mind is the eclipse in 2017. Um, and some of you, I'm, I, in fact, I suspect most of you had a chance to see that in either as a full eclipse or a partial eclipse because it was uh, the, the shadow of the moon traveled all the way across the United States. Uh, a whole group of us uh, traveled up to a small town in central Oregon, uh, which was right on the path of totality. And it was quite a fun time. There was, uh, this town was very small. It had a population of about 150, and we more than doubled the population when our whole group went up there. Um, so we kind of took over the town. And we had a great view of the, of the eclipse, and we had a lot of fun. Um, I have to confess, I got a little uh, inebriated one night uh, uh, because we were having so much fun. Uh, we, we sat around talking, solving the world's problems, and I uh, drank a little too much. So, But that was a really fun event. So I'd say that's probably the, the, the one that comes to mind right at the moment. Uh, a, a basic model of telescope, good for families and young children, beginner telescope. Uh, the one I would recommend actually was shown in Don Saito's uh, video earlier. It's called a Dobsonian telescope. Um, now, the first thing I would recommend you get is a pair of binoculars. And get a pair of binoculars, get yourself a good um, uh, book that shows the constellations and the locations of some of the, the interesting objects in the sky and just start learning your way around with a pair of binoculars. That's a good way to start. But if you want to get a telescope, you don't want to spend a lot of money, but you still want to see cool things. Uh, you get what's called a Dobsonian telescope. There are several different models. They come in different sizes, anywhere from about four and a half inches to about 18 inches. The one I'd recommend is either a 6-inch or an 8-inch. Uh, price will run you somewhere around $300 to $500. Uh, a Dobsonian telescope is a really good telescope optic system on a pretty cheap mount. Uh, the mount is like a lazy Susan, so it just sits on the ground and you rotate the telescope around left and right or tip it up and down and point it at the object. The nice thing is it has good optics, so when you point it at uh, the moon, you see a lot of detail of craters and so on. You point it at Saturn, you're going to easily see the rings of Saturn. 
you point it at some of the deep sky objects like uh, the Ring Nebula, you're going to be able to see those clearly. Uh, the downside to it is that it's all manual. So in order to point it at an object, you have to be able to find that object and point the telescope at it. And the other uh, issue is that it does not compensate for the Earth's rotation. So very expensive mounts will compensate for the Earth's rotation, but the Dobsonian mount does not. So you periodically have to nudge the telescope to keep the object you're looking at centered. But I'll tell you, there are a lot of amateur astronomers who uh, use primarily Dobsonian telescopes. They don't mind doing that little bit of nudging uh, because they get a really nice telescope for a relatively inexpensive price. So a Dobsonian telescope is what I'd recommend. This is a question from a six-year-old. What is the difference between a comet and a shooting star? Okay, so we got a six-year-old. What's his name? Does it say? Oh, okay. So we got a six-year-old asking, what's the difference between a comet and a shooting star? Well, in a way, they are related to each other. So a comet is a large chunk of ice and rock. Uh, this one here is about three kilometers in diameter, the comet Neowise. Uh, and it comes from way out in the outer reaches of the solar system, comes in close to the sun, which causes it to sublimate, gives off gas, releases all the rocky particles in it, and produces that tail. Now you remember that tail that you saw, uh, the tail had, uh, was kind of an arcing tail. In fact, I'm going to see if I can't get back to one of these images here and maybe we can actually see uh, what I'm talking about. Okay, here's a good one. Let's just switch back over here. Okay, so here's a picture of a comet. You see that white tail coming off of the comet. And if you notice, it's arcing a little bit. That tail is all those particles that were released from the ice when the ice sublimated. Uh, and these are tiny little pebbles. Some of it is just dust. Some of it is grains of sand. Uh, a lot of it is pebbles. Uh, nothing real big. These are just little particles that came off the, the comet. But as the comet orbits around the sun, these particles stay in orbit. Uh, and eventually this comet is going to leave this long stream of particles that is in a long orbit around the sun. Now, this particular comet, uh, its orbit does not cross the Earth's orbit at any time, but many comets do cross the Earth's orbit. Uh, there's a comet called Temple, and there's quite a few other comets out there that uh, do uh, cross it. Uh, and if the comet's orbit crosses the Earth's orbit, then that stream of particles that are left behind by the comet also crosses the Earth's orbit. And it crosses the Earth's orbit in the same place relative to the Sun. So uh, periodically what happens is as the Earth orbits around the Sun, it passes through that stream of particles left behind by the comet. And those particles then enter our atmosphere, they burn up in our upper atmosphere, and we see them as shooting stars or meteors. Uh, so meteor shooting stars are just little bits of rock floating around out in space that enter our atmosphere and burn up in our atmosphere. The comet tail is way out in space. The trail left behind by a meteor or a shooting star is actually in our atmosphere. And when we have meteor showers, like we have one coming up in August, the uh, Perseid meteor shower, uh, all that's happening is the Earth is passing stream through a stream of particles left behind by a comet. Okay, next question. What is the diameter? I think I just mentioned that, but it's, I believe it is three kilometers. I read that somewhere that it's about three kilometers. Now, of course, it is going through a, the process of sublimation, so it is losing mass. And as it loses mass, it shrinks. 
And, you know, it's not going to completely disappear this time around, but each time the comet comes back around, gets close to the sun, and starts going through that sublimation process, it loses a little bit more of the ices. Some of the rocky material actually is not ejected off the, the comet. It actually stays on the body of the comet. And eventually what will happen is the comet will run out of ice near its surface. And all that will be left behind is the dust and rock that remain with the comet. And then it will actually look more like an asteroid than a comet because it will no longer generate a tail when it gets close to the sun. Uh, and there are quite a few of these out there. I, I like to call them old dead comets or ODCs. And uh, they're just comets that have made so many trips around the sun that they've lost all the ices that can sublimate. And uh, now they look more like asteroids. Okay, next question. All right, well, let's see. Where, what time is it getting to be? It's almost 9 o'clock here. Almost time for everybody to go outside and see if they can find that comet. So, again, look to the northwest sky um, about 9.45 or so. Anytime after that, the comet should be above the horizon until about well, almost uh, 11 o'clock tonight, and it'll get higher each night over the next few nights. So... Uh, look out there, look for that comet, bring your camera, and see what you can see. So until next time, this is Gerald McKeegan up at the Chabot Space and Science Center. Don't forget to donate, and we will...